The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you still do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved for them. The Gospel of the Lord. So, you know, many of the characters in the Gospels, even the famous ones whose names we recognize, actually appear only once in the story of Jesus. In fact, even some of the first disciples of Jesus, the twelve original followers, some of them we only know about because they happen to appear in a list and say, here are, here are the disciples of Jesus, but we don't know anything about them because in some cases we don't know their names, and even if we do, they appear only one time. But in John's Gospel, Nicodemus is different. Nicodemus keeps popping up. We meet him for the first time in today's Gospel reading. Later on, in the middle of the in the middle of the gospel, he appears as part of a group of people in the temple who are discussing whether or not they ought to talk to Jesus some more to find out what he's doing before they condemn him. And finally, at the end of John's gospel, he appears again as one of only two people, along with Joseph of Arimathea, who's another guy who appears only once, who are the two people who have the guts to actually go take the body of Jesus down from the cross and bury him. That is actually a lot of times for anybody other than Jesus or one of his very closest disciples to appear in any of the Gospels. In fact, Nicodemus appears more often than some of Jesus' closest disciples. Yet, for all the times that we encounter Nicodemus, he really remains kind of a mystery. This is in spite of the fact that we know his name. You know, many of the people that we hear about who encounter Jesus, we don't even know their names. Some woman came up behind Jesus and touched the, the hem of his garment. Some guy in the crowd asked Jesus a question. We don't even know what their names were. But we know Nicodemus' name. We know something about what Nicodemus did. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling council of the temple authorities. Which is interesting also because that makes Nicodemus part of a group who is usually considered the bad guys. And yet he's not. And Nicodemus, what we know about him is that he said things. We have, we have record of his conversations with Jesus. We know what he did when he went and he took the body down and he buried the body of Jesus. A lot of times with the disciples of Jesus, other than they just sort of sit there and absorb what Jesus had to say, we don't know anything about them. And yet, Nicodemus remains a mystery. Because some of the most important questions about Nicodemus... <laughs> They never get answered. Most importantly, did Nicodemus ever become a disciple of Jesus? He's never called a disciple in the gospel. So maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. But yet he is still one of those people that took it upon himself to go and bury Jesus' body. So you've got to ask, did he or didn't he? 
did Nicodemus ever figure out who Jesus was? He comes to Jesus by night and he says, you know what, somehow or other we know nobody can do what you do apart from the presence of God. What's the deal? And then Jesus goes on and has this conversation with him about wind and spirit and being born from above. And, and frankly, you've got to cut him a little bit of slack if he doesn't understand what all this means, because none of us really understand what all that means either. And yet, we don't know, towards the end, did he really kind of get included and clued in with who Jesus was? Doesn't say. And why is it? Why is it that Nicodemus made such a big impression that John felt the need in his gospel to mention him over and over and over again. I mean, it seems like there are other, other people, other characters in the story who would have merited more press time. So there are lots of theories if you read the commentaries, but in the end, neither the Gospel of John nor any early Christian tradition can really answer those questions. Nicodemus remains a mystery. And probably, Jesus remained a mystery to Nicodemus as well. <clears throat> Maybe Nicodemus never did fully figure out who Jesus was. Maybe Nicodemus never did fully understand how God was working in Jesus. And maybe Nicodemus never did understand all this stuff about spirit and wind and being born from above. And yet, in spite of the fact that Nicodemus never seems to fully figure out God, John's Gospel presents him as somebody who never gave up on God, even if he wasn't quite sure what it was that God was doing. Because in spite of the fact that Nicodemus finds what God is doing in Jesus to be sort of a mystery in his life, he nevertheless was open to, the pre to experiencing the presence of God, even in unexpected ways and in unexpected people. You know, we read the story and we go, well, Nicodemus came to Jesus. Of course you go to Jesus, Jesus. But to Nicodemus at that time, Jesus was sort of a weird figure. I mean, he was an itinerant preacher who came out of Galilee, a place where nobody was really expected to know anything much about God. But yet, somehow or other, he saw what Jesus was doing, he heard what Jesus said, and he went, this, this just is not the way I expect God to work in my life from the life of other people but felt drawn to say, maybe God's trying to tell me something through this person. And he was open to experiencing God in ways and through people that just sort of seemed different to him. Nicodemus, even though God was still a mystery in his life, kept asking questions even when he did not fully understand all the answers. You know, it's easy for us to, to sort of kind of look at this and go, oh, Nicodemus, how come you can't understand this? Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? He could have actually said, well, you know, if that's the kind of answer you're going to give me, Jesus, I'm just going to give up on you and go find answers that are quicker, quick and easy someplace else. But he didn't. He kept asking that question and in the middle of the gospel, the, the ruling council in the temple is saying, we've got to get rid of this guy. And he's the one who says, wait a minute, don't we need to add you know, even in our law, it doesn't say we're supposed to question the guy first, find out what he's doing. Shouldn't we be exploring this more? He wanted to keep asking questions to figure out what it was that God was doing, even if he didn't get easy, compact answers to his questions. And Nicodemus, even though God remained, how God was working in Jesus was a mystery maybe to him, he kept on acting. Even <coughs> when his actions could have put his reputation and perhaps even his safety at risk. You know, it should not be lost, and maybe it is sometimes, that Nicodemus is a member of the ruling council of the, of the temple authorities, who are the people who handed Jesus over to Pilate to be crucified. When Nicodemus goes at night and buries Jesus, he is, in fact, if anybody finds that out, the council thinks he's a traitor. He could be killed. He, he takes significant risk in his life because somehow he wants to be part of whatever it is that God is doing even when he can't exactly figure out what that is. <coughs> Nicodemus, it seems, didn't give up on God, even and especially when he couldn't figure God out entirely. And perhaps that's what makes him an especially good figure for us to think about on Trinity Sunday. Because on Trinity Sunday, we, we end up talking about this idea that there is one God, but somehow God is revealed to us as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. 
So there's three, but there's one. There's one, but there's three, and that just doesn't make any sense. It's, in a sense, a mystery. And I had a, a professor, a senator professor, who was doing a course for us lately, and he said, you know, whenever the New Testament talks about mystery, mystery is not a logical um, thing that, that doesn't make any sense, that you just have to say, okay, up is really down, and down is really up, and outside is really inside, or something like that, and just accept it as though your brain doesn't work. Mystery means you experience something and it doesn't make any sense to you, but because you've experienced it, you know it's true. You know, he says love is a mystery. You experience it, you feel it, you know it's true. You can't really explain exactly why, you can't explain exactly how, but it's real. And, and the doctrine of the Trinity is really not a way for us to figure out how to neatly explain God by putting God in a little box or maybe three boxes, but it's probably not the Holy Spirit. It's rather a way of simply doing really what Nicodemus did, where Nicodemus says, you know what? Nobody can do what you do apart from the presence of God. God is fully in Jesus, and yet there is one God. How can that be? That's the experience. That's what Trinity really is all about. It's, it's, it's about actually describing the experience of God working mysteriously in our lives in ways that are bigger than anything we can imagine or understand and somehow trying to live in to that mystery. So, what then is this day supposed to be all about for us? We cannot solve the mystery of Nicodemus, let alone the mystery of God. But perhaps the example of Nicodemus can help us in figuring out how we live into this relationship with this mysterious God. For even when we can't fully figure out who God is or exactly what God is doing in our lives, Jesus invites us, like Nicodemus, to be people who continue each day to be open to the presence and the activity of God in ways and in people we didn't expect. You know, the first key for Nicodemus was being able to say, you know, um, this place, this person, going at night and finding out about God, that was never something they taught him in school about this is the way you neatly figure out who God is. But somehow he felt drawn that maybe I should pay more attention to this. Maybe I should pay more attention to this person. And you know, sometimes in our lives, what God is doing, what God is calling us to do, to do who God is calling us to be, can be more easily seen if we're willing to look outside the box and say, you know, maybe God's calling me to pay attention to this thing over here that's happening. Or maybe this conversation with this person I had, who's never been religious or seemed religious to me, is God trying to speak to me? Are we open to that? That's, that was how Nicodemus grew in his relationship with God, by being open to experiencing God in new and in different ways, and in new and in different people. Like Nicodemus, Jesus calls us to grow in our relationship with God each day by being people who continue to keep asking questions. You know, even if the answers aren't there or don't seem to make sense, the process of asking the questions and continuing to wrestle with the questions was how Nicodemus grew in his relationship with God and in, and in, and in his understanding of what God was doing in Jesus. It can be really easy for us because we all live really busy, stressed out lives. To, when we need to figure something out, I want you to tell me and I want you to give it to me right now so that I can easily figure it out and then move on to the next thing. And that just doesn't generally work in our relationship with God. We want to put God into a nice, easy box. Tell me what God wants me to do. Tell me how God is acting in my life. Tell me what it is that God wants for me. But often, those are things that only come about to us if we're willing to continue to ask questions and to rethink things and, and to sit and to wait and to pray, even as Nicodemus continued to wrestle his entire life with what God was doing. And, and that wrestling, is often what helps us to really more deeply experience who God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do. And Jesus is calling us also, like Nicodemus, to be people who each day act in faith that God is not done with us. See, it would have been easy for Nicodemus to figure that after Jesus' death, whatever God may have been doing in Jesus, well, it was over. But Nicodemus was one of the few people who, even after Jesus was hanging dead on the cross, was still willing to act in hope that God wasn't done with Jesus, that God wasn't done with him, and that whatever it was God was doing, 
It wasn't at an end. And so Jesus is asking us too, are we willing to continue to act in faith? To act even when things seem completely lost and, and things seem to have come to an end, are we willing also to be people who put our lives on the line and are willing to be people who do what we feel God is calling us, calling us to do, even if it's not clear how those actions are going to make a difference. I mean, Nicodemus didn't go and bury Jesus because he thought, boy, if I do this, then the gospel writers are all going to write this down and I'm going to be famous, you know, 2,000 years from now. He did this because he felt called to do it, even though he couldn't see exactly what his actions were going to do in the end. And maybe, maybe it is that God is calling us to be people who act in such ways that we advance the cause of hope and new life in the world, in a world which always somehow feels like it's done. See, today isn't really fit about figuring out or explaining God. Instead, it's about how God continues to reach out to us, even when God seems too mysterious for us. It's about not understanding all the answers, but about continuing to wrestle with questions. And it's about how God continues to invite us to live into a relationship with Him through Jesus, even and perhaps especially when that relationship involves experiencing God in ways and through people who somehow or other always seem different before, but now maybe are the ways that God is calling us to grow deeply, more deeply with Him and with us.